طيبة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على إشرف الأنبياء وإمام المرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقائدنا وقرة عيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين وأصحابه الغل الميامين أفضل الصلاة وتم تسليم After praising Allah جل وعلا I'm sending salutation for our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam proceed. And alhamdulillah that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has gathered us here tonight. Or not tonight. It feels like it's night, subhanAllah. It's been, it's been a very long day for me. It's morning or it's afternoon now. La ilaha illallah. I'm lost. That's what lockdown has done to us. I've even lost track of time. Allah musta'am. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala to make this a blessed gathering. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to make us from those who are forgiven this gathering. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to make us from those who said to you, مَغْفُورًا لَكُمْ Stand and disperse. You have been forgiven. And your sins have been changed into good deeds. وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزٍ أَيُّهَا الْإِخَوَ وَالْخَوَاتِ Allah wa ta'ala He tells us about the nafs, the nafs, your soul, and that this soul that Allah Azza wa has given us, and that has given us as an amana, as a trust, it does not belong to me, I can't do with it what I wish. This body that Allah Azza wa has entrusted me with, Allah Azza wa has taught us that it has rights, and it also has obligations that it must fulfill. In order to give yourself your rights, you must fulfill the obligations that Allah Azza wa has obliged upon you. That is how you fulfill the rights of the soul, right? That's a principle. In order to fulfill the rights of the nafs, of the soul, of yourself, you must fulfill the obligations that Allah Azza wa has obliged upon you. And Allah wa ta'ala tells us that the nafs, okay, it is three categories, three types of nafs. The first type of the nafs, it is a nafsul amara bisu, the soul that commands you to do evil, al amara bisu. Like Allah Azza wa Jalla says, when talking about uh, the wife of Aziz, right? When talking about her, he says what she says. Okay, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءِ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي She says, she doesn't say that, she, she doesn't, she says, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي I don't make my nafs innocent. Okay, when she was trying to seduce um, Yusuf alayhi salam and so on. And then she says, إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءِ Verily the nafs. It commands one to do a su evil. Illa marahim rabbi, except the soul that Allah Azza has mercy upon. Amara, Allah never said, Allah never said, yani, amira. Allah said, amara. The word amara, it shows, yani, mubalagha in the Arabic language, which means it's exaggerated, meaning that it is always commanding you to do evil. When you are given two paths, two options, one is good and one is bad. The soul would drive you towards the evil and the bad path, right? That is the nature of the soul, right? That's the first type of the soul. That's the soul that constantly disobeys Allah Taala. It is always sinning, always يعني, on the path that angers Allah Taala. That's the soul, amaratun bisu, and that's the lowest type of nafs, right? The second type, it is a nafsul lawama. The nafs which is a lawama. Lawama means the nafs that constantly has a go at you. When you do evil, it tells you off. It says, why are you committing evil? And it encourages you to repent to Allah Azza wa When you don't do good, it tells you off. and encourages you to do good. It's constantly telling you off and bringing you to account and holy accountable. And that's a pure soul, right? And that's the soul of the believer, how it should be. And nafsul lawama. And Allah Taala swore upon this nafs, this type of soul. Allah Azza wa says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. La Uqsimu Biyomil Qiyama. Wala Uqsimu Bin Nafsin Lawama. 
Allah swore upon and nafs al lawama indicating how great it is because Allah Azza wa only swears upon great matters and Allah Azza wa he tells the third category of the nafs the third type of nafs and this is known as a nafsul mutma'inna the soul that is tranquil the peaceful soul and Allah Azza wa he tells us about this soul he says Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'innah Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyah Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyah فَدَخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي وَدَخُلِي جَنَّتِي Allah says, Ya ayyatuhal nafsul mutma'in It will be said to the soul, the peaceful soul, the tranquil soul When it's passed away Ya ayyatuhal nafsul mutma'in O peaceful, tranquil soul Irji'i Come back to your Lord Radiyatan Pleased and Allah is pleased with you as well. فَدْخُلِ فِي عِبَادِي وَدْخُلِ جَنَّتِي That is going to enter paradise. That is the highest level the soul can reach, which is a soul that has found tranquility and peace and happiness and contentment in the worship of Allah and the obedience of Allah. And it has disciplined its soul that now it doesn't find it difficult to do good and it enjoys it and it finds the sweetness of doing goodness and khair and abstaining from evil. Right, it has become tranquil to that, and it's become it's found you know, peace in that. Right, that's the highest level. These are the three types of the soul. Every single one of us should aspire to get to that level of an nafsul mutmainna, the soul that is mutmainna, mutmainna, yani the tranquil soul that is constantly seeking the pleasure of Allah, looking for the pleasure of Allah Azza in everything it does and everything it says. Subhanallah. And now comes to what are the rights the soul it has and through these rights we'll find out what the obligations that are upon the soul which will help us get to an nafsul mutma'inna or keep us at least at al nafsul lawama and not take us down to an nafsul amara bisu the nafs that commands us to do evil طيب. we have the first right that the nafs has upon you that the soul has upon you it is that you Purify it. The first right that our souls have upon us, it is that we purify it. Imagine Allah wa Ta'ala, He swears the longest oath in the Quran. SubhanAllah, it seems that, yes, Ustaz Dihaya Rabi uh, has temporarily frozen. Um, I will drop him a call and um, I'll get him to join, inshallah. So, Alhamdulillah, that talk was um, really inspirational, Alhamdulillah, and we've learned so much okay. already. Oh, I, I, I think I'm back. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, Sheikh. Sorry about that. We had um, a, a fuse must have flipped in the house or something like that, and all the lights and, and the internet and everything went off, SubhanAllah. Technical difficulties, SubhanAllah. Tayyip, um, where were we? Who can remind me where we were? Yes, Allah swears the longest oath. That's the last thing I said, mashallah. AM was listening carefully. طيب, Allah ta'ala, he swears the longest oath in the Quran. Allah Azzawajal, he says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wal Shamsi Madduhaha, Wal Qamari Ida Talaha, Wal Nahani Ida Jadlaha. وَاللَّيْنِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا 
والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما طحاها ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها الله تبارك وتعالى He says He swears upon the sun, the moon, the night, the day يعني 11 times It's the longest oath in the Quran And Allah تبارك وتعالى when he makes an oath and he swears in the Quran, it is to indicate what is coming after the oath is an important matter. It's extremely significant. You need to pay attention. Allah Azza wa is telling us what's coming next. Jawab al-Qasam is extremely important. Pay attention to it. What is Jawab al-Qasam? Allah Azza wa tells us, Qada aflaha zakaha. Successful. Is the one who purifies it. Purifies what? His nafs, his soul. That is the successful one. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And the one who makes it filthy, right? He is the one who has failed. The one who makes it filthy or buries it in evil and sin and dirt, right? He has failed in the dunya and akhirah, right? Indicating how important it is. Now imagine, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلْ الْأَعْلَى And to Allah belongs the highest example. Imagine, a, I come to you. And I say to you all, Wallahi, wa billahi, wa tallahi. And I keep swearing يعني, 11 oaths one after the other. You're going to pay attention to what comes next, right? You're going to think well, what I'm going to tell you next is very important. So, what about Allah ta'ala, who is the most truthful? And He is telling us that if, if we do this, we are going to be successful, right? So, we need to purify our souls. How does one purify the soul now? We know the importance of it, and Allah Azza has told us that it's important. How does one do that? The first step to purifying your soul, it is that you repent to Allah and seek forgiveness from Allah Azza wa from the sins that you have committed. Because what makes your soul filthy, it is sins. What purifies it is repentance and the doing righteous deeds after that. That is the first step that one takes, is repentance. The second step, okay, it is educating the soul. Ilm, to educate it, because the reason why, one of the main reasons why the soul, it encourages you to do evil, or if we fall into evil, it is due to ignorance, right? But the more we enlighten the soul, and we educate the soul with ilm, with knowledge that benefits the soul, right? Especially the knowledge of the deen of Allah Ta'ala that will spiritually cleanse us, it will purify the soul. It will purify your soul. No doubt. There's no doubt in that. That is the second matter. Al ilm is nur. Imam Shafi'i rahmatullah alayhi came to his teacher, Waqib al Jarrah, and he was complaining, Imam Shafi'i was complaining about weak memory. And Imam Shafi'i rahmatullah had extraordinary memory. He was able to memorize the page just by looking at it. He had photographic memory to the extent that he would have to place his hand on the other page not to memorize it accidentally because he didn't want, he didn't want to memorize it. Right? So Imam, Imam Shafi'i rahmatullah he comes to his teacher, Waqi'i Ibn Jarrah, and he says to him, he's complaining about his weak memory. So he says in lines of poetry, he says, فأرشدني إلى ترك المعاصي وأخبرني بأن العلم نور ونور الله لا يهدى لعاصي He said, I can be to Waqi' my poor memory. فأرشدني So Waqi' his teacher, he said, instructed me and told me to abandon sins. And he told me that sins, okay, I'm oh, sorry, and he told me that knowledge, okay, it is light. It is going to enlighten you. It, Allah Azza is going to enlighten your heart with it, your soul. 
And then he said, And the light of Allah Azza wa Jal, يعني, of knowledge, it is not gifted to a sinner. Meaning the more you sin, the more distant you're going to be from this knowledge. So once you have repented, and then you have started learning, Allah wa ta'ala is going to enlighten your heart and your soul and purify it, no doubt. Right? Now, that is the second matter. The third matter that an individual, he needs, or the third step that we must take in order to purify our souls and to and it's strengthened our relationship with Allah wa ta'ala. no doubt it is that we increase al-amal al-salih, we increase the voluntary righteous deeds after obligations, we have perfected obligations we increase the righteous voluntary deeds the more we do the righteous deeds and we increase them, okay Allah wa ta'ala will increase our iman and that automatically will purify our souls and we will inshallah ta'ala rise up to the level of a nafs al mutma'inna inshallah ta'ala because the nafs that mutma'inna the soul that's mutma'inna it is the soul that enjoys worship it enjoys acts of righteousness acts of righteousness and good deeds it enjoys it rather it finds sweetness in it and that's why people like Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah Ali he would say stuff like inna fi dunya jannah man lam yadkhulha lam yadkhul jannah al-akhirah bury in the dunya there's a jannah paradise Whoever does not enter the paradise of the dunya, okay, he will not enter the paradise of the akhirah. Subhanallah. What is that uh, paradise of the dunya? It is the sweetness of iman, tasting it. Shaykh Islam Mateem is reported by his student Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi. He would say that his Shaykh, he would, after Salat al-Fajr, he would sit until Dhuhr, noon, reciting Qur'an, Remembering Allah wa ta'ala and so on. And then his Ibn Qayyim will ask him, Yani, why is it that you do this? You know, he says, he would say, This is my breakfast. If I don't do it, I can't function in the day. SubhanAllah. Look at that. That's a level that they have reached that they found that sweetness of ibadah. You have narrations like Sufyan al rahmatullah alayhi, that he would pray Salat al-Maghrib. After Salat al-Maghrib, he would pray the Sunnah of Maghrib, the two rak'ahs of Sunnah that are after Maghrib. And then, Rahi, Rahimahullah wa ta'ala, would go into sujood of that voluntary prayer. And he would not get up from sujood until the Adhan of Isha was called. Why? Because he found the sweetness of the sujood, the ladda of ibadah. The sweetness of ibadah, he found it. And he was enjoying it so much that he didn't want to stop. He didn't want it to end, right? That comes with knowledge. That comes with knowledge. The more you know Allah, the more you know the names you know the names of attributes of Allah, the more you love Allah and you worship Allah and you fear Allah, right? With that knowledge comes fear, which will discipline the soul, no doubt. Okay? So this is the first right of the soul, which is to purify it. The first right of the soul, which is one of the most important rights of the soul which is to purify it. Number one, it's with Islam, and after with repentance and turning back to Allah and with knowledge and with righteous deeds, purifying the soul. The second right of the soul, okay, it is to not harm it in any way. This body that Allah has given us and our soul, our ruh, it is not, it's not something that belongs to me that I can do whatever I want to it. I can't harm it in any way. The moment I harm it, I have committed a sin. And I have committed a major sin. I'm not allowed to kill myself. I'm not allowed to use any substances that harm my body. I'm not allowed to do anything that harms my aql, my intellect, my mind. I'm not allowed to use anything that will harm my ruh and so on. La. All that is a mana. Allah told you, look after it. Right? Allah says, وَلَا تَقُتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Allah says, do not kill yourselves. Very Allah Azza wa is merciful towards you. Meaning that anything that could harm your soul, okay, it is haram. And ayyuh al-kiram, here's the benefit. The sharia, our religion, Islam, it is here to protect five matters. They're known as al-dharuriyat al-khamsa, the five necessary matters that Islam protects. All the legislation of Islam, 
they either protect these five matters or they benefit it. Everything that Allah has prohibited, it is because it's harmful to either one of these matters or more than one of them. And everything Allah has obliged, it is because it protects one of these matters and it benefits it. What are these five matters? Number one, it is a deen, religion, your religion, your religiosity, your Islam. Anything that harms your deen, it's haram. Everything that benefits and protects your deen, it is either obligatory or recommended. That's number one. Number two, it is a nafs, your soul, your life. Anything that harms your life is haram. And everything that benefits or protects it is either obligatory or highly recommended. That's the second matter, the nafs. The third, it is al-aql, your mind. Anything that harms your mind, okay, it is haram. And anything that protects it or benefits it, it is highly recommended. The fourth, it is your wealth, al-man. Anything that harms your wealth, it's haram. And anything that protects it or benefits it is either wajib, obligatory, or highly recommended. The fifth and the last one, it is al-irv, your honor. Okay? And that, what comes under that is also your family and your, your lineage and all that stuff. They come under your honor. Anything that harms your honor is haram. And anything that benefits it or protects it, either wajib, obligatory, or highly recommended. Now, let me ask you a question. Why has Allah Taala prohibited zina, fornication? What does it harm? I, I, I want to hear answers from you. I've got tired of talking to you. Now, you need, I need to hear from you guys. Let's have some interaction. Uh, tell me in the chat. Why has Allah al right? It harms the ilb. Your honor and the lineage and all, yeah, and all this makes it get mixed up, right? And it causes corruption on earth as well. And it causes illnesses, right? There's illnesses that come from it which harm the nafs and so on, right? Why has Allah prohibited gambling? Uh, why? What does it harm of this? It harms your man, your wealth, of course. Why has Allah prohibited riba? Interest. Because it harms what? Ah, uh, yalla yalla, quickly, quickly. Be quick, Alman, Jamil. Why has Allah Tabarakallah prohibited alcohol? Hmm. Because it harms your mind and also your, your body, right? Your liver and so on. Why has Allah Tabarakallah prohibited uh, all forms of uh, substances, drugs that's, that are harmful? Why is it haram? Because it harms your mind and it harms your body, you leave effects, right? طيب. Why has Allah Taala obliged that you pray salah? Why? It pres- Who said that? Rufayda, Rufayda. I think it benefits all five. All five. Okay, it benefits it when you pray salah. Allah Ta'ala wants you to be the most successful. So he obliges upon you matters that will benefit you in every way. When you observe the obligations like Salah, we said, what did we say at the beginning? When you observe the obligations that Allah has obliged upon you, you will fulfill the rights of your soul, your nafs. Right? Salah is an obligation. When you fulfill it, you will fulfill the rights of your nafs. When you don't fulfill it, you have oppressed your nafs. Because Allah Azza wa he says, Allah Azza wa he says, okay, that acts of disobedience, he calls them in the Quran, Allah says, Inna iddata shuhuri inda Allah ithna ashar shahran fi kitab illah yawma khalaqa samawati wal ab minha arba'atun hurum thalika ad-deenu al-qayyim فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah says, after mentioning the, the four sacred months, Allah advises and said, do not oppress yourselves in these months. What does it mean to, to oppress yourself? That you commit sins. 
when you disobey Allah, you're oppressing yourself. Because now you haven't fulfilled the obligations of Allah, you have gone against it. So what have, what have you done? You have oppressed your nafs when you don't fulfill the obligations of Allah. You see? Now, طيب, جميل. So now we have understood the second right of the nafs. It is that you, okay, do not harm it in any way. The third, okay, there's many rights of the nafs, but I'm going to mention some of the most important ones that, uh, that I think that should be highlighted. Because talking about the rights of the nafs, okay, it's, it's, it'll, mentioning them all will take a long time. But I'll mention some of the most important ones, inshallah. Ta'ala. The third right of the nafs, it is that you allow your nafs to have some of the matters that Allah has, prayed, has, has made permissible, not prohibited. That you allow your nafs to enjoy some of the matters that it desires that Allah has made permissible within a limit. Okay? Like eating, drinking, Allah has made it permissible. The soul desires it, right? It requires it. Rather, the Salaf Rahimahullah Azza wa Jal, they would say that my body, it is like a vessel. I fill it with, I give it food and drink so that it can help me with my worship and the purpose of my life. That's the, what, that, that's the reason why Allah Azza wa and he wants us to eat and drink. Allah says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Allah says, eat and drink and do not be excessive. Do not be wasteful. Allah does not love, and Allah Azza wa Jal uh, does not like or love those who are wasteful and are excessive. Right? So why is that important? giving your nafs what it desires in terms of the matters that Allah has made permissible. The ulama Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, and this is a profound statement, and this is very important that many people they don't understand. In order for you to get to a nafs al-mutma'innah, okay, you must allow your soul to have some of the things that it enjoys, sometimes like playing, right, and some amusement, and joking, and laughing, and eating, and drinking, and sleep, all this stuff. The things that it enjoys, right? Not completely preventing it from it. Why? First of all, it requires it to live. But secondly, if you completely imprison this soul and you don't allow it to do any of the stuff that it enjoys, not even a little bit, then the soul will not allow you to do any good. It will give you a hard time when it comes to doing good and righteous deeds. It won't help you. But when you give it an element of that, the matters that it desires that are halal, right? And the soul will allow you to do good. It's a matter of finding balance, and that balance is very important, right? And that's very important. Many people do not understand that. People think that I'm going to discipline the soul means that I don't do anything that is that my soul desires. I don't joke. I don't laugh. The Prophet is better than me, you, and better than everyone. He is the one who did joke and he laughed and he had time. He enjoyed. He had times that he enjoyed with family. He would um, and he watched things that were and that were music and so on. Right? Because the soul naturally it enjoys these things. You have to give it an element of that so that the soul can help you when it comes to doing the righteous deeds. That's very important. People need to understand that. That is, is an important matter. Right? It doesn't mean that I completely imprison the soul and I stop it from doing everything that it enjoys. Let, do everything within limits. Within limits. Don't be excessive. Don't go overboard. Don't waste time. Don't be someone who all he does is joking and playing about just wasting time. And it makes him heedless from the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. Likewise, don't be someone who constantly, oh, he's always miserable and he never laughs and he never has fun. And at the same, and he's, he thinks that he only has to worship in Allah Azza wa Jal. It is just by reading Quran and praying Salah, etc. La, these things that you do, which are amusement, the one who's smart is the one who changes it and he makes it into good deeds through his intention. Whilst he's doing things that are mubah, that are permissible, that the soul enjoys, and he makes it an act of worship through his intention. He's doing it to please Allah wa ta'ala. Or he has an intention that I'm eating, drinking, or I'm sleeping so that I can rest, or I can get some energy so that I can worship Allah Azza when I get up my sleep, after I eat, etc. I can worship Allah Azza better and I have more strength. Allah Azza wa reward you if you have, you have these intentions. Right? This is the smart believer, the, the mindset that he has. Right? And then after that, one of the important rights, the fourth right of the nafs, and I know I'm short on time, it is that you protect the nafs from everything that angers Allah. Okay? You protect your soul from everything that angers Allah. 
your eyes they have rights upon you that you don't look at what Allah is not pleased with your ears they have rights upon you your ears they have rights upon you that you don't listen to anything that angers Allah your tongue has rights upon you that you do not state anything and utter anything that angers Allah and all of what I mentioned now it is summarized in hadith of the Prophet if we implement this hadith, we have to feel the rights of the soul, insha'Allah ta'ala. All of what I mentioned, all these four matters, okay, it is stated in the hadith of the Prophet sallam, which is the hadith Qudsi, a sacred hadith he narrates from Allah ta'ala. The Prophet sallam, he narrates in the hadith, he states in the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiyallahu anhu arda, that he narrates from Allah ta'ala, that Allah ta'ala said, Man aada li waliyan, faqad aadantuhu bil harb. Allah says, whoever declares war against an ally of mine, Allah says that I declare war against them. Whoever shows enmity towards an ally of Allah, Allah shows enmity and declares war against them. And then Allah Jalla wa ala says, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَبْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ That my slave does not draw closer to me with something more beloved to me than that which I have made obligatory upon him. Okay? And then, ولا يزال عبدي يتقرب إلي بالنوافل حتى أحبه. And my slave does not draw close to me with the voluntary deeds until I love him. طيب. So Allah told us now the most beloved deeds to Allah عز وجل. It is the obligatory deeds. What did we say at the beginning? The principle is that in order to give your soul its due rights, you have to fulfill the obligations that Allah has obliged upon us. The most beloved deeds to Allah are the obligatory deeds. That's number one. And then the hadith says that. This, my servant doesn't constantly draw closer to me with voluntary deeds until, huh, what happens? Allah says, I love him. So, Allah will love you the more you do voluntary deeds after you perfected the obligatory deeds. If Allah loves you, what happens? Allah says, if I love him, I will be his sight that he sees with and his hearing that he hears with and his feet that he walks with and his hand that he grabs with. Meaning that Allah will protect your eyes from seeing haram your ears from, from listening to haram, your mouth from uttering haram, your hand from doing anything haram, your feet from walking to anywhere haram. Yani Allah Azza wa Jalla will enable you to do that which pleases Him. That's what it means. What's the formula? The formula it is that you are a mu'min, a believer, okay, who perfects the obligatory deeds and observes them and tries to perfect them, and then He follows it up with the voluntary, with voluntary deeds, and then Allah Azza will love Him. When Allah loves Him, Allah will protect you with that. And what I say is that to make it easy, oh, the obligatory deeds, there's no negotiation in that. We have to do it. Find one voluntary deed that your soul is inclined towards and that you find easy. There's all different types of voluntary deeds that we find easy. Some people, they find it easier to pray a lot of Qiyamul Layl, the night prayer. Allah has made, made it easy for them. Some people find it easy to recite a lot of Quran. Some people make it, it's made, it's made it easy for them to seek a lot of knowledge. Some people, it's been made easy for them to do a lot of dhikr, constantly remembering Allah. Some people it's been made easy to give a lot of charity. Some people it's been made easy for them to, to do other different acts of worship. Everyone has something has been then soul is inclined towards. Find at least one that your soul is inclined towards and then stick to it and don't abandon it. And with that, Allah will love you and Allah will protect you from doing disobedience and he will allow you to do that which pleases him with your limbs, with your nafs. Right? And then the hadith goes on to say, okay, okay, if my slave asks me, I will grant him whatever he asks for 100% Allah says. And if he, seek, if he seeks my protection, Allah says, I will grant him my protection 100%. And then Allah says at the end of the hadith that and nothing Allah dislikes more then take you my, the soul of my slave because I know that he dislikes death and I don't want to harm my slave anyway. So look at that. Allah Azza wa dislikes even taking your soul because Allah knows that we dislike death naturally. Naturally, we don't like death. So Allah Azza dislikes doing it, but it has to happen, right? For us to meet Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. That summarizes all the rights because we said that the rights of the soul, it is that we purify it. In this is purification, that we purify our soul. We said that within, the, from the rights of the soul, it is that we protect it from disobedience. And we mentioned that in that, it's mentioned in the hadith. 
right? Allah Azza wa that's the formula for Allah Azza wa protecting us. We also mention from the rights of the soul, it is that we allow it to do things that are mubah, things that are permissible, right? So that, which is voluntary deeds, or, or with the intention you can make it to voluntary deeds, and Allah wa ta'ala will uh, reward you for it, and so on, right? So we ask Allah wa ta'ala to make us from those who hear this speech and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala to make us from those who fulfill the rights of their souls. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala to make us from those who fulfill this sacred trust that Allah has entrusted us with, which is our nafs. And we ask Allah azza wa to make us from those who are forgiven. And we ask Allah azza wa to forgive our sins and to accept our repentance and to have mercy upon us. And we ask Allah wa to make us from the righteous slaves. And we ask Allah azza wa just like he united us here, this afternoon to unite in Jannah to Fiddus Ala. And we ask Allah Jalla Fi Ula to make us from those it said to O Mumafu Alakum, stand and disperse. You have been forgiven and your sins have been changed into good deeds. InshaAllah Ta'ala, if there's any questions, we'll take them, inshaAllah, with the time remaining. What are the best voluntary deeds? Jamil, that's a very good question. The scholars of Islam, they differ upon what is the best voluntary deed that an individual he can do in order to draw closer to Allah Azza wa But the best voluntary deed, a lot of the scholars, they believe it is Talab al-Ilm. And Imam Ahmad Rahimullah Azza wa Jal and others, they, used, they believe that seeking knowledge, it is the best voluntary deed. The best voluntary deed that you can engage in it is seeking knowledge, right? Because seeking knowledge, it benefits you and it will benefit others as well. And generally, the, the best deeds in Islam, right, as a principle, are the deeds that don't only benefit you, but the benefit of the deed, it extends to others as well, right? These tend to be more virtuous than the deeds that only benefit you, right? Wallahu a'lam, and Allah knows best. Now, is it possible that some deeds are made easier than others? Example, seeking knowledge, one may feel great pleasure in engaging in it, but voluntary fast, one may find difficult and vice versa. Could you perhaps elaborate on this? Now, that's exactly what, what I was mentioning earlier on. Allah wa ta'ala has created us all differently. And some of us, we find it easy, for instance, to fast a lot of voluntary fast. Allah has made that easy for us. And some of us, Allah wa ta'ala has made it easy for us to seek knowledge and we find we enjoy it, we find enjoyment in that, we find it easy, and so on. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he says, Everyone, it has been made easy for them what they have been created for, right? Allah has created us all differently, different personalities, okay? Different uh, uh, interests, okay? We have different uh, things that we like and all this stuff, right? And the same thing with ibadah. Allah has made us, يعني, has made certain acts of worship more, we has made us more inclined to certain acts of worship and made it easier for us to a certain extent and others perhaps يعني, not as easier than these the acts of worship right so the voluntary deed that you find the easiest you need to discover it and you need to hold on to it and make it your uh, your rock that you hold on to in order to seek the pleasure of Allah Allah my nafs has been struggling with music and I want to know its position in Islam as well listening to music with good lyrics and inspiring lyrics as well as the sheets with instruments. طيب. طيب. First of all, we ask Allah to protect us all from evil. We ask Allah to help us in overcoming the desires of our souls and the evil that our souls they call us towards. Music, the position of Islam regarding music, it is that music is haram without any doubt. And that is, and there is evidence for that. First of all, in the Quran, Allah tells us, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي لَهُوَ الْحَدِيثِ لِيُضِلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لِيُضِلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ وَيَتَّخِذَهَا هُزُوًا أُولَئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُهِينٌ Allah says from mankind, okay? are those who purchase lahwa al-hadith. Lahwa al-hadith, here it is, okay, idle speech. Abdullah Mas'ud, the great Sahabi, 
the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they understood the Quran better than all of us because it was revealed to them, right? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he says that there's not a single verse in the Quran except that I know why it was revealed, where it was revealed, upon who it was revealed, for what reason it was revealed, and the interpretation of it. And if I knew, if I knew anyone who knew better than me, I would travel to them as far as it takes, as long as it takes. Meaning that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were extremely knowledgeable, they knew the meaning of the Quran better than any other person, right, after the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, regarding this ayah in Surah Luqman, he says, Wallahi, he swore three times, Wallahi, 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 I swear by Allah, but lahu al-hadith, idle speech here, it is music. Al-ma'azif, al-ma'azif, what is music? Yani it's the instruments. What is prohibited is it's the instruments that are being used that accompany the lyrics, right? So that's haram. And the individual, he, he must know that this is a sin. And this is a sin that kills the heart. And a heart that is inclined towards music, it will not be able to have the Quran in it as well. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, he says, Hubbu al-hani al-ghina, loving music, okay? And the Quran, fi qalb al في قلب العبد ليس يستمعان in the heart of a slave they, in the slave they don't come together music Quran they don't come together either one or the other one will yeah, defeat the other right so we have to purify our hearts from this as when it comes to lyrics right inspiring lyrics lyrics okay you can read lyrics to listen to lyrics that have no musical instruments if they are good speech okay what we look at is the good speech if it's if it has vulgar language in it or it's calling us towards evil, or it's encouraging evil, or it's encouraging things of like haram, etc., then it's haram. But if it's encouraging goodness and calling towards the, the Islam, or uh, obedience of Allah, or, or teaching us about Allah, or, or, or telling us about good character, or, or good morals, or in the, and motivating us, etc., and it has nothing evil in it, then it's haram, it's permissible, right? So we look at the content of what the lyrics uh, have. That's the second matter. As for the third matter, which is what is uh, regarding Nasheed's, okay, Nasheed's, okay, poetry. Okay, poetry is permissible. We can listen to poetry. They said the same thing as the lyrics. If the, if the lyrics and the, and the verses of the poetry have nothing that is haram in it, we, it's absolutely, we can listen to it and there's nothing wrong with that. But when they're accompanied by instruments, not allowed. We're not allowed to listen to it when they accompany by instruments. Instruments are impermissible. The only exception that is made for instruments is one which is the duf, the duf is the drum. And that is not at all times, it can only be used in certain occasions. When it's a wedding, the women specifically are allowed to use the duf, the drum, okay? Okay, Eid, when it's Eid, they're allowed to use the duf. And also on the battlefield, the women, they hit the drums to encourage the men. That's the three exceptions that we made. Other than that, you're not allowed to use the instruments. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, now. Being able to limit uh, excessive enjoyment or self-control is important for our nafs, as you mentioned earlier. And how can we begin practicing self-control? That's a very important question, subhanAllah. And I should have mentioned it actually. That's a very important question. I thank the questioner for that question. How does an individual practice self-control? How does one discipline his soul, right? I'm gonna, I'll give you a, a, a story. And this story that I heard from one of the Salaf it's, um, it's really, it quite blew me away subhanAllah, to the extent that how they would discipline their souls, all right? It is said that one of the salaf from the previous righteous and uh, predecessors, he dug a grave in his house. He dug a grave in his house. And every time he felt like his soul was slipping away and it was becoming too attached to this world, okay? He would go into the grave and he would close the grave and then he would cry out, My Lord, bring me back, my Lord, bring me back, my Lord, bring me back. Just like when the soul passes away, Allah tells us that the soul that was evil is going to ask Allah, let me go back to the world so I can do righteous deeds. Right? And then he will cry until his, he terrifies his soul. And then he will get out of the grave. He'll kick the top of the grave off and he'll get out of the grave. And then 
he will say to his soul, Ya nafs, oh nafs, listen, you have been given a second chance. Do good and benefit from the second chance and stay away from the evil so that you can benefit from your second chance. I'm afraid that you're going to get to a stage where you're going to ask for a second chance and you will not be granted it. That's when you actually die, right? So they will place fear in their heart, subhanAllah, right? And the second matter, which is quite important in order to discipline the soul, right? It is to hold yourself accountable. We mentioned earlier on, nafsul lawama, the soul that constantly holds you accountable, right? You constantly hold yourself accountable for what you're doing. You, you blame yourself. You have a go at yourself. You shout at yourself. Right? You tell yourself, why have you not done this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing all this? Right? I should know better. Every single day you should do muhasaba. A day should not go past, except that at the end of your day, you reflect on your day and how your day was, and you have muhasaba. You hold yourself accountable. Thirdly, it is that you surround yourself with people who will help you um, grow and help you discipline yourself and encourage you to do so that you surround yourself with people who have that same mentality and that same mindset but if you surround yourself with people who are excessive in all sorts of enjoyment and doing everything then you'll be like them but you surround yourself with people who help you in your growth and to discipline yourself and to have self restraint and control then inshallah ta'ala that will encourage you as well to do the same inshallah ta'ala wallahu a'lam now and the most important is to make a lot of du'a as well, of course. To make a lot of du'a that Allah helps you. The Prophet Ali Sultan constantly used to say, A'udhu billahi min shadi nafsi. I seek refuge in Allah Azza wa from the evil of my soul. Right? Constantly make du'a to Allah Azza wa Jalla. He protects from the evil of your soul. And that Allah Azza wa grants you. Right? Al-wasatiyah. To be someone who takes the middle path. On the topic of music, what should we do if these are in places which are difficult to avoid, like workplace, shopping centers, restaurants? Barakallahu fika. When it comes to music, right, there's a difference between, in the Arabic language, we differentiate between two matters. These are two different words. It is hearing. It is listening. If I'm walking past, okay, a shop, or I go into a shop and I want to buy something from a shop and I'm going to leave, okay, and they have music playing. I have not gone into a shop to listen to the music. I have gone there to buy something and leave, right? So that is known as sama, hearing. I was not listening. Because listening is when you intend to listen to the music. You, you're listening to it, you're enjoying it, etc. Right? So when a person hears music, he's not held accountable for that, inshallah ta'ala. But he tries to avoid as much as possible in being in surroundings like that. You shouldn't make it normal that I sit in surroundings like that. It's only what is necessary that you, you have nowhere else to go and it's absolutely necessary that you go into a place Right, that has music, then, then that's a different case. But if it's not necessary, you can avoid it. You have to avoid it. But the second matter, which is tima, that I actually listen to it, then I am held accountable for that, and I am sinful because I'm the one who intended to listen to it. I turn on the music. I'm there, right? Now, so there's a different. We have to differentiate between those two matters. Uh, what is the best way of increasing the quality of the obligatory prayers? Uh, Jamil, it is by increasing our khushur. By attaining more khushu in our in our salah, how does one attain khushu in his salah? That requires a lecture, but there's this beautiful book that I advise that you read. Okay, by Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah azza wa jal. It is called Asrar al-Salah. Okay, in, in Arabic it's called Asrar al-Salah, which is uh, translates to the secrets of the prayer. It's actually been translated into English, but they, the title is completely different in English for some reason. Well, it's close; it's not very far off, right? Which is is titled the inner dimensions of the, of the prayer. The inner dimensions, okay, of the prayer. Okay, you you read that uh, that book and it'll give you, inshallah ta'ala, how you can improve the quality of, of your prayer, inshallah ta'ala. Because if I was to go into it, now it will become a lecture. And I know that uh, we are short on time. So read that book. It's a very small book. It's a small booklet. It's not, it's not very big, right? You can read it in a day, but take your time reading it. Don't rush through it because I want you to really grasp the concept that he's telling you and to digest it so that you can implement it in your salah, inshallah ta'ala. And I promise you, inshallah ta'ala, after reading your book, you have a whole different perspective on the salah and you enjoy it more, inshallah ta'ala. Is there any difference between the mind, heart, soul, and how they are inclined? And if so, what is the relationship between the soul and the other two? The mind, heart, and soul 
they are attached. They are attached. They are connected, no doubt. And they need each other, right? They need each other. Uh, if so, what is the relationship between the soul and the other two? Unless it is a, it's a very technical question and it requires a very lengthy answer. However, if I try to summarize it, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala in the Quran, when he uses, okay, for instance, a nafs, okay, which means a soul, right, which is yourself, it entails all of these three matters. It entails everything. It entails a soul, your mind, your heart, everything. Right? It's when the word nafs is used. When the word qalb it is used in the Quran, it's only meant by it your heart, by itself. And then we have a lub, which also means the heart. But it does not only mean the heart, it means the heart and the mind together, your intellect together. Right? They're connected because they function together. But all of this, they come back to one point, point which is the heart. Right? The heart it's, it's connected to the limbs. Everything through the limbs is connected to the heart. Right? The heart. And the heart is the king of the limbs. So if you want your limbs to become upright, you need to purify the heart and make the heart upright. As we have in the hadith of Prophet Ali Salah, if the heart is sound, the rest of the body will be sound. Right? And then we have and the mind follows that too. The mind follows the heart. It's connected to the heart. As for the soul, the soul, it can be separated at times and is attached at times. The soul, okay, at times is with it. As most of the time it's independent because the body and the heart, all this, it will die. But the soul will not die. What will be punished in the grave or we reward in the grave? It is the ruh, the soul. That what will be rewarded in the hereafter. It is the soul, right? As for the body and the rest of it, it will... Uh, Expire, right? He has expired it. That's a summary. I, I hope that answers the question, right? Now, Wallahu alam, and Allah Azza He knows best. Now, but you, I, I guess this person is asking that to recite some ayat, right? Is that what they want? Absolutely, I believe so. Hundred percent. You believe so? Does Does everyone agree? If they don't, if they disagree, then we won't do it, inshallah. If you disagree, we're yes. gonna kick you out. <laughs> I want a person to disagree. Yalla, disagree. Play, play. Khalas, we're aside. Looks like no one's going to disagree. La ilaha illallah. Play. La ilaha illallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. بسم الله الرحمن ونفخ في الصور فصعق ما في السماوات وما في الأرض إلا من شاء الله ثم نفخ فيه أخرى فإذا هم قيام ينظرون وأشرقت الأرض بنور ربها ووضع الكتاب وجيء بالنبيين وجيء بالنبيين والشهداء وقضي بينهم بالحق وقضي بينهم بالحق وهم لا يظلمون ووفيت كل نفس ما عملت وهو أعلم بما يفعلون وسيق الذين كفروا إلى جهنم 
حتى إذا جاءوها فتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها وقال لهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم رسل منكم يتلون عليكم يتلون عليكم آيات ربكم وينذرونكم لقاء يومكم هذا قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين قيل دخلوا أبواب جهنم خالدين فيها فبئس مثوى المتكبرين وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها وقال لهم خزنتها سلام وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم طبتم فدخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله وقالوا الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض أورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء فنعم أجر العاملين وترى الملائكة حاها من حول العرش يسبحون يسبحون بحمد ربهم وقضي بينهم بالحق وقيل الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين um, could you kindly let us know the reference of those ayat so that we can look into the translation, inshallah? It is the last page of Surah Zumar. I have no idea the number of the ayat. I have not memorized num- uh, ayat numbers. I'm not Dr. Zakir Naik. I can't tell you <laughs> chapter number and ayat number, but I can tell you the name of the surah and the page. It's the last page of the surah, of Surah Zumar, inshallah. Barakallah <laughs> fiq. Ustad Yahya. It's an absolute pleasure. Who am I speaking to? Who is the person speaking to me? Who's this voice I'm hearing? A lovely voice. Huh? So, so uh, myself. So, so am I speaking to Abdullah? Who am I speaking to? No, Which no, voice? You're speaking to Sami. A brother from Manchester. Gosh. From Manchester. I love you, yeah. Sami. Have we met before? I believe we haven't. Very briefly, I made a very funny answer to one of your questions that you once asked at a retreat. And... Uh... <laughs> I don't think you remember, but it was a good laugh. I probably would. I definitely would remember. Oh, Remind me, I remember. I it was remember. a first retreat you did with us, very beautiful retreat to, I believe it was well, Lake yeah. District. January. Lake District. Yes, January. Of course, I remember that. Very well. Yes. Nah. Allahum barik. MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairi ya Sami. MashaAllah tabarakallah. May Allah reward you all and all the team for their great efforts and putting your skills and good deeds. And I ask Allah ta'ala to make us sincere in our statements and our actions and I ask Allah wa ta'ala to accept our deeds from us and to grant us taqwa for value those who have taqwa Allah Azza wa accepts our deeds and I ask Allah Azza to bless you all and to grant you all contentment and happiness and success in all your affairs and mm-hmm. I hope to meet you all inshallah ta'ala one day ta'ala, face to face after all this passes because I am really getting fed up with these online stuff you know it's not my cup of tea but alhamdulillah it's better than nothing Allah alhamdulillah
امين بارك الله فيك وفيكم بارك الله فيك خلاص اي ونت تيك مور بي تايم استاذ اف يو كان ستيل هير اس وي هوب تو سي يو سون ان شاء الله جزاك الله خير